Hi folks, here we are again. It's Richard here and I've got the famous Brad Fuller with me. Uh, if you've watched any of these others, you'll get the gist. We'd had a big recording day about three weeks ago, but I had, there was a technical hit, so we were putting on new uh, intros and outros. So we go back a long way and this this covers, this talk covers so much awesome terrain. It literally blew my brain, Brad. I've been painting the sunroom skirting boards, listening to Neil Noddings, who I'd never heard of before. I've downloaded other articles that you've referenced, and I, I want to hunt these people out on YouTube because it was a real eye-opener and refreshing to see that um, kind of what what I really believe in from my heart, there's other other people with credibility who have actually written things called books that are, are talking about. And your insights as well. So this is a fantastic, I know it's a 45-minute chat, but um, it was brilliant. Brad is a is a music teacher, but more than that, you can see behind him uh, some guitars, but they're not just guitars. If you notice, there's four strings, which makes them, most of those, at least two of them are bass guitars. Yes, all of them. Yeah, All, all of them are bass guitars. And so Brad's a yep. muso and a bass player. Why the bass, Brad? What is the bass? Why the bass? Uh, because it was there. The classic, uh, which, is the, which is essentially how every bass player got their start, because the drums the guitar singing and keyboards were taken <laughs> but you're you a classic you're, tale yeah but then once you got into it you realized how phenomenal the instrument is well nobody yeah it's not until you play it that you go holy moly wait a second this thing is incredible yeah. and actually the bass player is driving the whole organization so uh i'm very fortunate i would guess this i was the uh, second best drummer in my school, but upon taking up the bass guitar, I was immediately the best bass player and, because and I was the only one. I've seen bass play. Uh, I've seen Brad play many times. Seriously, uh, unbelievable bass player. All right, folks. So let's get into this. This is a. We've already recorded this before. Phenomenal uh, audio chat. You won't see Brad's talking head, unfortunately, but you'll see some screenshots. This is great. I've. It's blown my mind. I hope. I hope you get a lot out of this. So here we go. Here's a revelation that I got when I encountered Brad first up, is that, ah, oh, so there's two types of music teachers. There's, there's really good music teachers who, are, who know their music theory and who probably play the piano or play a couple of instruments really well, and they teach music to kids and they do a great job. Then you get a musician who also knows this theory, who also plays instruments, who also teaches music. And that's a whole nother thing, especially if it's contemporary based, because what you're doing is you're giving students an experience of being a musician, which yep. is a whole other thing to learn in the piano. And, and that was like, for me, that was quite a wow. That's a bit of a wow moment. And then when I think about what, what I was trying to do in my classes is I didn't want to teach stock standard mathematics, which is, I'm gonna, you know, in, in, this year I'm going to teach you 120 new formulae and, and you know, you're going to do all these uh, 700 questions in a textbook and hopefully you'll do pretty well and then you'll pass the exam. I wanted to give kids some sort of experience of being, a math not being a mathematician, but investing, having a sense of what it is to investigate, like a mathematical experience, investigating, inquiring, um, you know, challenging, working together, problem solving, that type of thing. And so that's where I see the parallels. Yes. Um, the other thing about Brad, I'll say, is that he's he's even more left field than what I am, and I've always been drawn to left of field people because there's not we need more of them. So I'd like to just kick off by asking Brad the question, um, and you know this this could involve a very long answer. What would you say, from your experience, is the number one aim for you as a teacher, or the most important thing about being a teacher, or uh, you know, working with kids, like what, what's it really all about? Because I, I, I know what a lot of the recent, you know, education gurus say, and, and I know it's not, it's not what, what I, I think you're on a different level. So there you go. What, what would you say is really important? Uh, to be a part of fostering an environment where a person can become more fully human. That is poetry. Uh, Do you want to say that again? I, well, to foster an environment where a person can become more fully human. So what do you mean by more fully human? I guess to provide, provide and foster an environment 
uh, which promotes human flourishing or uh, what's often been called the good life to help to help people to live a good life, but not just in future, but today. So in the moment, how are you? Great. I'm flourishing. And so uh, Aristotle called it eudaimonia. Uh, and it, for a while it was called the good life, but the most recent uh, um, translation that's uh, gained traction is human flourishing. Right. So that, so that uh, in all of your wheels of humanity, uh, and so becoming more, more uh, fully human, all of those wonderful things that we human beings are capable of, and I, well, it's still we're not quite sure what human beings are capable no, of no. yet. I still, I think, I think the there's so much out. more that we can. Yeah. So we're born, uh, and then we experience the world. We create the world uh, by getting to know ourselves uh, through others, and so that's that's the essence of it. How can I help young people to become more fully human, which is actually uh, manifests through them living a good life, now, but oh, not the future, can right I, now, today. Okay, so I can imagine. I can people. I can imagine people listening to this thinking, "Well, that's all very well, Brad, but you know, like seriously, how's that helping me in my in, with my classes next week?" And so, can I give you my interpretation or? Or angle yeah. on what I think you're saying there, and and that would be that you're approaching your teaching as almost an equal. Well, yeah, you're you're playing a different role to the students because you're the teacher and the students. But on another level, yep. you are equal individuals. You are dealing with human beings, not students. Yes, you're talking. Yep. You're you're communicating. Whatever you use the word talking, yes. you're communicating with these other human beings that are in your environment, yes. that are under yes. your care, in yep. a way that um, helps them to relate to their peers and or colleagues yep. in a similar way, as equals, with an open heart, this is good. in the moment. Yep. Um, and so, in a musical, in a in a musician's sense, that would that would open the door to more collaboration about working on a piece of music that they're, they're composing or rehearsing, not putting each other down, but encourage, encouraging, having fun. And because and, I know that there's, in when you're in a band and when you're playing music with other, other, other people, there's another level of communication that can happen. There's a joy that can happen. Um, and that's that attitude that you're describing will foster that much more quickly than someone who's talking down to these lesser than kids in the room. So, right, you've got to play your drums now and do that and stop mucking around and blah, blah, blah. Am I on the track here? Yeah, that's beautiful. So uh, eudaimonia is about, or human flourishing is about for self and others. Right. So it has an ethical component right. in it. Uh, and so Aristotle talked about praxis, uh, which takes... So there's, which actually says that the whole point is to put knowledge to work for the benefit of self and others. Wow. So who cares? One plus one equals two. Yes, but who cares? What's the point? Let's put that knowledge to work for the benefit of self and others. Yeah. Why do I need to know that? Well, if you can't answer that question, then <laughs> you're in trouble. So... Uh, and so Christopher Small uh, has been a massive influence on me, and I, th I think you would love him. We haven't talked about him. No. Uh, but so he's, uh, he's a Kiwi uh -huh. and, uh, who went to England and eventually went all over. But he says, uh, music is a human doing. It's not a thing. It's something that humans do. And he says the products of music are concretions of things that humans do. But first and foremost, music is a verb. We music. And so I think, uh, and he says, so music is a metaphor for life. It's the same. And Herbie Hancock, the great jazz pianist, says there's music and there's life, and you can't separate the two. Yeah. So Christopher Small says, well, when, we, when we're doing music, which he calls musicking, he says we're actually doing life. It's the same thing. And so 
isn't that a beautiful thing? So when the students come into my music class, uh, actually our music class, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're practicing life. Mm. It's, not, it's not separate from life. It is life. Uh, and I think so that is the point. And so we need to, so when we, we're not learning about music, we're learning in music, about music, but most importantly, through music yeah. for the benefit of human flourishing. So there's got to be, we've got to put it to work. It's got to be helping us to become more fully human and it's got to be for self-benefit, but really importantly for benefit of others. And just getting back to your point then, because uh, uh, you, you t touched on a really important thing about human beings being in a space together. Mm. <clears throat> uh, and so Freire says, uh, he, he never talks about teacher student. He always talks about teacher dash student. So it's this, it's because it's difficult with language, right? Mm. Um, and and you can't really encapsulate, but teacher dash student, because the teacher is a student. Yes. And then he talks about student dash teacher. Yes. So the student is a teacher and the teacher is a student and we're people and we have this thing to do and we're learning about it as we do it, but we're most importantly, we're learning through it. And that to me uh, is, that's how, that's how you have a nice time. So I'm thinking back to a, a one of the conversations I had with Colin, Colin Klupik, and we were talking about, he, he mentioned uh, that he'd spoken to his um, pre-teacher people. His point was, you know, rather than trying to uh, deal with management in, in teaching, how about if it was just teaching? The reason I'm saying that is a lot of teachers are so focused on, I've just got to keep the lid on this class. I've, I've got to keep yes. the lid, keep, keep it all under control, just get through a lesson where... I haven't got kids, you know, killing each other, metaphorically, yep. or killing me, more to yeah. the point, metaphorically. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If that teacher, if those teachers aren't thinking of the possibility of actually being on the same page and having an yep. environment where the kids want to be in the room, then yes. there's no there's no progress. So that's the first step. And and yep. and but then that and that's what I try and do a little bit is trying to articulate what does that look like? What does an you know, in a yes. truly an authentically engaged classroom look like? And it is one mm -hmm. where there is this connection going on. There's the student slash teacher. You're, you're talking to these kids as humans, but there's a lot of collaboration. You know, it's, it's not, it's not a conservative traditional environment. And I've never really thought about this before, but I think you're describing something that's okay. Well, now we've got this, got this, harmonious, on the same page, kids want to be in the room environment. Mm -hmm. And I'm more of a facilitator. I'm very busy, but I'm a facilitator rather than mm -hmm. telling them what to do all the time. You're, by what you've just said, you're articulating what that's all about, which is yeah. doing life, uh, which I'd never really yeah. kind of thought about. That's how I see yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess to I. I used to think about so that we can take our place in society, but, you know, who wants to do that? Uh, and so Freire says that actually we, it, that's the whole point, right? <clears throat> and Dewey talks about it as well. Yeah, right. So we, we don't want to prepare students to take their place in the world because guess what? They're already in the world uh, and we don't want them to take place in the world. We want them to create their world right. and we want them to do a heck of a lot better job of it than we have. I'm not the guy to come to to say, this is how you do stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm the guy who can say, well, here's how I tried. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> here's a few things I've learnt along the way. What have you tried? Yeah. So uh, in, in dialogue with, with each other, and I think um, that I, I changed a, a long time. I changed my approach to uh, coming to school to teach, to come to school to learn. Mm. And... That's it. That's because don't, so, don't, don't, don't you know, in your in your experience in your career don't you find that uh, well the learning thing I think you're saying or partly you're saying I'm learning from my students about how to mm -hmm. be a better teacher or yes, how to be and a better learner right and, and a better learner and and a co-facilitator so yep. if you come in with that attitude you learn your your the graph of learn the graph of learning goes up and up and up mm -hmm. because you're 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 uh, you're sucking in the experience whereas 
you know, I feel sorry for the tra traditional teacher directed, right, oh, now you're going to do this now because mm -hmm. there's, there's the space for them. They, they can only get better in that very confined way of 18th century teaching. And I'm, I'm not yes. trying to put people down. People, you can only do what you can do, but there's not yes. much support for people to break out of that. In fact, I think there's no. a whole push to push teachers back into that even more. Look, can, can yep. I can I say one thing? Like, I, I wanted to actually talk about student agency and, and the importance of mm. having kids own their own learning, which I think is mm -hmm. a really big deal. I suspect you've never really given the idea of it's important for kids to own their own learning. I don't think you've ever really given it much conscious thought because my impression would be that it's, for you, it's such a, such an obvious thing that you, you're not even going to give it any the time of the day because you're you're beyond that. You've always been wanting to create this thing called life in your in your classrooms and outside of your classrooms with your kids. So it's just a no-brainer mm -hmm. that they're going to take responsibility over the learning that you've never really get, given it much of the time of day. It, would, would that be correct? Yeah, because I think it starts with uh, I love Nell Nodding's uh, education philosopher, uh, her book. An ethic of care is one of the greatest pieces of work ever and just sits completely in opposition, I think, to this whole notion of control. And she says, our job is to be first one caring. And so, so she, once you get into this education philosophy or philosophy generally, you find it very difficult to not string words together. So she is a great hyphenator, yeah. just like Freire and all the great philosophers. So she has one dash caring. So for our first job is to be one caring. And what do we do? We care for our students um, because how do the students know how to care unless they've been cared for? Yeah. So my job first is to care for the one. So I'm one caring and I care for the one. And then the one feels care, sees care, and from that care, learns to care for me and for others. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. And so you're never going to win the battle of control. And, and wait a second, why is it my job to control anybody? And I don't know if, you've, uh, if, you're, if people are abreast of what's going on in politics in Australia, but our politicians are looking for somebody can, to control them. Our politicians are out of control. Yeah. Our business people are out of control. Yeah. Our councillors, yeah. the whole shebang. And, and so the, the question in the media is always, who's going to control these people? <clears throat> and where do, have we learnt all of this, Richard? I'm pretty sure we've learnt it at school. Yeah. And so we're just looking for the principle of Australia to come in and suspend all of these people. So it just seems to me like... Uh, we really need to rethink the whole setup. Uh, and, and the downside, uh, I mean, the, the, the sad thing is that pedagogues and philosophers have already rethunk yeah. over the centuries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but for whatever reason, educators um, and uh, one educator writer talks about the Bermuda Triangle of uh, social amnesia and bifurcation and myth and how over, so we get, we get this thing, there's, there's good teaching and bad teaching. And then there's the myth of, well, in the old days, here's how we did it. And then the social amnesia comes in when we go, we don't even know what happened in the past. Uh, uh, and so when someone says, well, this always used to work, we go, well, is, that must be right because I don't know what happened in the past. <laughs> so society has forgotten that we've had great pedagogues who, and so every time somebody puts their hand up and says, I think there might be a different way. People go, no, this has always worked, but it hasn't always worked. And we're not the first people to have this conversation, Richard. Yeah. And that is, that's the shame of it. And so uh, I, I just encourage teachers to go back and look at the history of education and find these great heroes who have said, like Nell, Nod Nell Noddings, uh, who, whom I think wrote the first edition of Ethic of Care in the 80s and just laid it all out. For those uh, teachers out there that are saying this control thing, I'm not sure if this is uh, this doesn't. I'm not sure if this feels right. I wonder if there's another way. Yes, there are okay. other ways. So, you're. I love like when when we're talking with Brad. It's a very big picture that we're that you're talking with him, right? So I, I want to try and yep. bring it bring it down to some simple terms. 
Yeah, that's good. Because we're talking, we're trying to get to agency, right? We are. But you're, you're, you're talking control here and how yes. you know, control is a bit of, you know, the impression I'm getting from you is it's a bit of a myth. I mean, the ultimate, mm-hmm. see, I think the ultimate control is what, you were to, what you've been talking about, about creating an environment in your classroom where life is happening, where there's, the, I can't remember the words you were using, but mm. that where there's a situation where these kids can become better humans, right? Yep. Well, I think mm-hmm. that, that, isn't that the ultimate control? It not even looks like control, and then probably it's the wrong word. Yeah. But it's control from the sense of you're no longer thinking about classroom management. <laughs> you're not thinking about behavior. You're not thinking about, oh, when's this kid going to derail my lesson? Mm. That's, that's so far in the past. It's not even part of your reality. You're part of the team, and you're, you know, from a music sense, you're... Let, we're going to explore this piece of music we're composing and 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 rehear- and practicing and blah 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 and and, yep. and we might go off in another direction in a mathematical classroom sense it 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 could be that you know we're, we're exploring we're just doing some more mathematics but the the kids are working there's a lot of peer teaching going on there's a lot of collaboration there's it's really hard to shut them up at the end of an exercise because they're so into what they're doing. You know, it's like, oh, kids, come yes. on, stop, stop, stop. I just, I just, I just need to say this one thing. Quiet, yes, you know? yes. I was always in that situation. It's like, come on, mm-hmm. Sam, please. Thank you. You know, mm-hmm. you can't, you can't tell them off because they're just so into what they're doing. And, and you know, yeah. So there's that, and in, 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 say, in a history lesson, you know, the, the teacher, um, you know, it might not be a historian, but they're giving the kids a sense of what it would might be to be a, hi- a historian, or or, or mm-hmm. really piecing these chunks together from the past to the future to the present and all this sort of stuff. You know, so that's the control thing. Thank you. I, I I'm always amazed when I do these things and start chatting with people at where we think it's going to go and where it actually I goes. No, it's a marathon. Uh, Oh, yeah, look, and just one thing leads to another, right? Yeah, and there's a lot of gems there. So I would, I would do what I do, and you know, it's save the URL and just check out the the time, the video timestamps below, and just check out some of the stuff that Brad was talking about, and and, and the references. I'm putting some links to these people, uh, and there's a fantastic discourse that Neil Noddings gave probably 10, 20 years ago, which is brilliant. Uh, that's what I was listening to when I was painting the <laughs> painting the sunroom. Anyway. Hopefully you got a lot out of that and uh, we'll see you in the next one.